Hello, this is Maurice Jackson. Before we present today's interview, I'd like to remind our listening audience that I'm a licensed broker to sell precious metals through Miles Franklin, where we have unlimited options to expand your precious metals portfolio. Stay tuned to the end of our interview for contact details, and I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you. Welcome to Proven and Probable, where we deliver mining insights and bullion sales in the form of physical delivery, offshore depositories, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us for a conversation is Nick Appleyard, the president, director, and CEO of TriStar Gold. Mr. Appleyard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me today. Glad to have you on the program to share the value proposition before us in TriStar Gold, which is focused on developing gold and delivering value. Before we delve into project specifics, Mr. Appleyard, please introduce us to TriStar Gold and the opportunity you present to the market. I start gold. We have a project called Castello de Sonios, which is reasonably early stage. We've got a, a scoping study we published last year, great results, and now we've just financed through the end of feasibility, which we're starting now. This is what we're here to talk about, and that's what's going to show the value to our shareholders that we de-risk and move this very exciting project forward through the feasibility and then into production over the next few years. TriStar Gold's projects portfolio is located in Para State of Brazil. Take us there and provide us with some historical context on the region. Yeah, Para State is one of the major mining locations within Brazil. Um, there are two states in Brazil, Minas Gerais and Para, which receive 80% of the mining investment into Brazil. Um, it is a state which has the state government uh, dedicated and set their aim to become the main source or main recipient of mining investment in Brazil, so they're a very pro-mining state. The The area we're in close to us, we have, um, it's historically been logging, informal mining, agriculture, and it's now being developed for soybeans. So the infrastructure is going in for the soybean industry. And um, and that's sort of what's been opening this part of Para State up. It's, it's a mining area but it's now getting the infrastructure coming in through the agriculture, which it makes it a real win-win for us. Yeah, that certainly will help out with the capital expenditures as we uh, delve into that later. Why does TriStar Gold have full confidence that they have the next great discovery in Paris State? Well, I think we already have the discovery, and I think what gives us the confidence is, um, is one word I'll probably repeat a few times through the interview. It's, it's simple. We have a very shallow ore body. We only drill 120 meter deep holes. We have very simple metallurgy. We have very simple geology, uh, simple open pits, a simple process technique, no deleterious materials on the environmental sides. We have a simple tailings facility. And, and me as a mine developer, historically over the last 20, 25 years, I know that mining projects get complex, and as they get complex, they get expensive and difficult. So the simpler I can keep it, the better. And I think that's what makes this project so special, the simplicity and the potential scale that it already has. Let's visit your project portfolio. Take us to your flagship Castella de Sanos project and share with us the project highlights and geology. Okay, Castella de Sanos, it's, um, for those who are interested in English, that means the Castle of Dreams. It is a, an ancient paleoplastic deposit. That means that the gold was effectively being shed from a mountain range with primary gold deposits in it, being caught in a, a large alluvial fan and then deposited in that fan and then buried for effectively 2.1 billion years. What that means to us and what we like about that and what that really signifies to our shareholders is this alluvial fan is huge. Out the plateau that we're developing is about nine kilometers across and the conglomerates go edge to edge and we haven't really found the limits of it yet. But also what that means to us is what I referred to earlier. It's simple because that gold has been winnowed down from primary deposits. All of the sulfides, all of the minerals that gold may have been tied up with have been weathered away. We are left with sand and gold and quartz cobbles in the conglomerate and almost nothing else. So it really makes it a deposit where it's it's simple to understand the geology very predictable and and it has the scale and the scale again it's easy to predict because we know 
if gold is in a stream at one point, it's going to be in that stream 500 meters downstream as well. It almost cannot be because the laws of gravity require that it will be there. So it's, it becomes very predictable. I think that's what we really like about this. It's the geology is very well understood and that understanding allows us to understand the scale and scope of this property. You know, sticking with geology, you have a tremendous amount of exposure to outcrops. How does that fit into the narrative? Well, what that allows us to do is focus for the next 10 plus years on shallow open pits. We don't have to worry about the underground side of the mine. There are two deposits around the world that are analogous to Castelo de Sonhos, um, Tarqua in Ghana and Jacobina in Brazil. Both of them are very, very similar geologically. Both of them started as open pit mines and then developed into open pits and underground mines as they grew in time and age. We even touched on the underground potential at Castelo de Sonhos yet because we have at least 10 years in front of us to evaluate this shallow open pit, which is the cream, which is, so that's the bit we're after now. So having something like 16 to 19 kilometers of conglomerate that outcrops the surface with gold in it that we can identify, you know, gives us a, a long horizon to look at with just the open pit technology. TriStar Gold has completed a PEA. When was the PEA completed? And please walk us through some of the numbers. Yeah, we, we published our PEA in November last year. Uh, it was a very successful one for us. Again, we focused on shallow open pit material. Also being a smaller company, we have the opportunity with a deposit like this of going for a larger scale mine with a higher capex and a higher net present value or a smaller scale with a lower capex and a higher rate of return. Due to the market, when we're looking at 1250 gold, and uh, lack of liquidity in the market, we chose to go for a smaller, higher return project. So with that, we ended up with a PEA that produced 1.1 million ounces of gold at a base case price of $1,250 an ounce. But with that was add an IRR pre-tax of 51% rate of return, or post-tax of 43% rate of return, and an NPV of $320 million nearly. Initial capex is only 184 million, and um, we get payback in less than two years. So it, it's an astounding property from that point of view. The PA was completed using a responsible, conservative number of 1250 gold price. How do the economics change at 1500 gold price? That's interesting. I, I've had a look at that recently, and we are by nature, I think, a very conservative group, and we have never looked that high. Um, the highest we've looked at was about 1400 and at that 1400 our post-tax IRR jumps into the mid-50s and our MPV is around $400 million. At 1500 I, it would be even, even, even better, but then you would also see other moving parts within the deposit as we would change to a larger scale mine. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think that does show, and I'd like to also reiterate this, that we, you know, we are a conservative group. You know, so. When we looked at 1250 gold, the highest we took our sensibility or our sensitivity test checks to was $1,400. So. I had an opportunity to review TriStar Gold's key development metrics. Which metrics has the company most excited? As a, as a mine developer, the, the one thing I just love about this is what I said earlier, everything is simple. We're talking a small mine, so your mining costs are low and controlled, our process costs are low and controlled. I think the one thing that is, is the best about this compared to a lot of projects I've worked on recently is that we are close to the infrastructure. So the our costs, our 184 million capex is nearly all directly related to the mining of the project. There's no huge costs for long, you know, for getting water to the site or getting power to the site or getting access to the site. Those things are all readily available for a, a small amounts of money. We are only you know, close to the infrastructure. So that really helps. I think that's the one level that makes us really excited is that we are close to the infrastructure. So there's no big cost blowouts. And then everything else is simple so far, as far as we know. All right. TriStar Gold has a current mineral resource in the inferred and indicated classification. Share some of the tonnage, grade, and metal content from both of those classifications. Okay. Yeah, we have total of 
total ounces is 2 million ounces, but in, within indicated, we have about 18 million tons, sorry, 1.2 grams for 0.7 million ounces. And in inferred, we have 40 million tons at one gram for 1.3 million ounces. At this stage, there is no measured resources. What can you share with us about metallurgical results? Metallurgical results on this are outstanding. That's, that's the easy thing to remember. Um, due to the nature of the rock, it is literally like a coarse sand with fairly fine gold between the sand grains. So once the rock is crushed to about 150 microns, we will get we get 98% recovery. And again, that sounds exceptionally high, and it is exceptionally high, but it is also the same as what they achieve at Jacobina and Tarqua. So it's not unrealistic that, to expect that for a commercial scale as well, because they, they do achieve that at those mines. Is TriStar Gold actively drilling? We are not. We have just completed raising money within the last week or two. And we are now mobilizing rigs to site, and we expect them to start drilling in September. And those rigs, are they Diamond Core or RC? They will be RC rigs. Um, one of the advantages of being able to drill is just shallow holes, and the shallow open bit allows us to drill RC. Um, the massive benefit to us on that is it gives us a larger sample, <clears throat> gives us a, you know, sort of a, a, theory, a better statistical analysis of the gold grade. We also use an optical televiewer combined with the RC, so we get a crystal clear image of the inside of the drill hole. So from the RC, we're at about half the cost of diamond drilling, and we drill faster, we get a better sample, and we actually get more information because the optical televiewer gives us more information than you can derive from just looking at core. Have you identified your target areas? Yes, we have. Yes, we are effectively taking the PEA and we will be upgrading that to a feasibility now. Um, with the recent funding from the sale of a 1.5% royalty to Royal Gold, their requirement, their guide, guidance to us was to take this PEA and turn it into a feasibility study. So, so the feasibility, so the PEA pits are our obvious target to infill them to increase the category or upgrade the category of the resources. Let's discuss some important topics germane to the project. Beginning with reversionary interest, are there any on the project? No, we own the property 100%. There are some royalties, as I, I mentioned earlier, people may have seen in the news, we have just sold 1.5% royalty to Royal Gold for $8 million. And we have an existing 2% royalty on the property already. So there's a 3.5% royalty on the property. Other than that, we have own 100% of it. Now, we slightly alluded to this earlier um, regarding capital expenditures. How is infrastructure on your project? It's, again, it's one of the sensational aspects of this project. We are a straight line, probably 15 kilometers off of the main sealed highway that goes up the center of Parar State. Along that highway are high tension power lines with available power for us. Um, on that but the highway at the turn off to the project, there is a town of around 10,000 people, which is a, has a labor force, and they are all skilled in heavy machinery, mining, logging, agriculture. So it's exactly the sort of people you will want working on a mine. They're also exactly the sort of people who will not object to having a mine 20 kilometers down the road from them. Um, the other side on the infrastructure is there are no deleterious elements such as national parks or indigenous populations. Which is actually my next question. What is your relationship with the indigenous population as well as the local community? And it sounds like there's no challenges there. No, the local population in, in the village, which is actually called Castello de Sonios, is, is very, very good. They, uh, as, as I mentioned, most of those people were transplanted from southern Brazil during the 1980s and 1990s during the land reallocation programs. So they're not people with deep roots in the, in the area. They don't have a deep association with it. And there are people who work in primary industries such as agriculture, logging and mining. So they are supportive of us. They, they're very familiar with the project. And we have people in the communities most of the time. So that's very good. There are indigenous populations probably closest 80, 80 70 or 80 kilometers away, other side of a river. Um, we have no contact with them and we don't imagine that we will. Are you fully permitted? Yes, we're fully permitted for where we are right now. As, um, 
as you move through and advance projects in Brazil, there are different targets to acquire. We've, we've filed everything and we're up to date on, on the permits that we need. The main concession is in the process of being converted from an exploration concession to a mining concession. That should happen over the next year and um, and things will move forward quite well. As we said, it's, it's very nice to be in a jurisdiction where the state government is very pro-mining. Is the ultimate goal for TriStar Gold to develop the Costello de Santos project and sell it or build a mine? I'm a little agnostic on that. For me, it's a business decision. Historically, um, when I've been involved with international minerals, we discovered properties in, 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 the, in the Andes in Peru. We recognize after taking them through to feasibility level or scoping and feasibility that in that case, Hothschild's mining were the world experts at underground mining in the Andes. And we could make more money for our shareholders if Hothschild's mined them rather than us going through a learning curve doing it. We are totally capable of putting this mine into operation, but if a better scenario comes along for our shareholders, it's a business decision. There's no ego involved that we have to be operators or we have to own this mine and build it. It's, it's purely a numbers game. We've discussed the good. Let's address the bad. What can go wrong and what is your action plan to mitigate that wrong? What can go wrong? Mining, the mining projects I've been involved with when things go sideways sometimes, it always comes down to community relations. Um, sometimes it'll have an environmental aspect, but it is generally if you lost the support of the communities, you, you risk the project. So I think that's always the one, the biggest thing that can go wrong. Um, if we're talking specific to one project, other than obviously gold going down to $800, which I don't think anybody thinks it will do now. So for me, it's all about the community. That's, that's where you, you have to keep doing your work and you have to keep doing it continually now as we move forward because it's it's hard to gain their trust and it's very easy to lose it in any scenario, wherever you are, whether you can be in Nevada, Nevada Ontario, or Pará State, Brazil. So for me, the, the biggest risk in most projects is the communities close to you, keeping them on side, keeping them informed, and keeping them on understanding what you're doing with this project, how it's going to benefit them, and make sure it does benefit them. So you are being a good corporate neighbor. Switching gears, let's discuss the people responsible for increasing shareholder value. Mr. Appiard, please introduce us to your board of directors. Okay, well, the company was founded by Mark Jones when he sold Brazoro to El Dorado. And so he is still on the board. He's our chairman. We have Brian Irwin is the corporate secretary. He's a lawyer, a retired lawyer out of Ontario. We have uh, Dr. Quinton Hennig, who is the chairman and founder of no Novo Resources, which is another paleoplaster. And Quinton is, is essential because he is one of the three or four world experts on paleoplasters. And it's a great asset to us to have his knowledge available to us on the board. And also it's a nice check mark for us that he recognizes this, the quality of this paleoplaster deposit. We have Len Kroll, who is an ex Newmont geologist on the board. And then, critically important, we have a Brazilian component. We have Carlos Valenia, who is one of the leading mining attorneys in Brasilia. Um, so he really helps us with the Brazilian side of moving a project forward and operating down there. And then, obviously, I'm on the board as well. Who is Nick Appleyard, and what makes him qualified for the task at hand? Okay, I am. Um, I'm a geologist from Australia originally, but I worked for a long time for a company called International Minerals, developing or living in Ecuador and Peru, developing projects in those two countries, and then and then in Nevada. I became a resource estimator and a mine developer. Really, we I became leading the team in doing the scoping studies, the feasibility studies for Rio Blanco in Ecuador, Gabi in Ecuador. Pine Catter and Immaculata in Peru, Goldfields and Converse in Nevada. And doing those those studies and bringing those assets forward to production decisions, and, and two of them, Pine Catter and Immaculata, are now the core assets of Hothschild mining, the sensational mines that we discovered we took forward to production decisions. And we worked out the best way, the most profitable way to get them into production. But what happened, 
while I was running the technical part of that company, I developed a team of people who I call friends and who I admire amazingly, you know, I hugely admire professionally, who also develop minds and they have complementary skill sets to mine. So when I took over TriStar about three years ago, I brought with me the CFO, I brought with me great exploration geologist, a resource estimator, a process um, engineer, as well as access to world-class environmental people and social community people that we've worked with, some of them for over 20 years now. Who is on your management team and what skill sets do they bring to TriStar Gold? The management team, we, we try and keep it as streamlined as we can. It is re realistic. It's myself, a CEO president, Scott Bransden, who was with me at International Minerals and Chaparral Gold is the CFO. What he brings is a wealth of experience at international transactions. He was a CFO for Plaza North America, so he has got a great experience and exposure to the large companies and the large corporations, knows how they work, knows how they like to see data presented to them. And for doing any type of cross-border transaction, I don't think there's anybody better than Scott. So that's our CFO. And then our vice president, Mo Shravasava, is a resource estimator and a geologist. Um, and again, he is exceptional. He actually, or he literally, wrote the book on resource estimation called Applied Geostatistics. He published the technical paper that defines the formula for the variogram along with Dr. Harry Parker. So, and, and he is an extremely good geologist. And a, probably better than just a geologist, I would say he's a scientist. He will look at all the information and compile it and get you the right information to go where you need to go. And then using his medicine statistics that he has to be able to then predict what you're going to get when you get, when you get there. So. Who do you have on your technical team? Okay, down in, down in Brazil, we have Fabio Mosa. He's our chief geologist in Brazil. He's a um, local Brazilian, very, very experienced, worked for a long time for RTZ. And he is our main man at the project and main person in Brazil. And also, very, very importantly, this is one of the skills I recognize in him that he has that is so critical. It's he is very, very good in the local communities. Every time I go to site with him, he'll take me to what's happening and show me the geology, the outcrop. That's obviously critically important. He'll also take me and we'll talk to the local farmers, we'll talk to the local garret bearers who are you know, off of our project, but still want to keep them friendly. And he'll take me through the local community and introduce me to the, to the people, keeping everything friendly, keeping everything above board. So he, he is fantastic for us down there in that, in that manner. We also have a um, process engineer is Tony Brown. He's in North America here. He is a, you know, an elite metallurgist. He founded a company called MRDI a few years ago, which is through acquisitions now become Amec. And again, he has done more process design than I probably you know, <laughs> seen sunrises in Arizona. So very, <laughs> very, very good, you know. And, and then we also have access to additional people, additional geologists and some amazing environmental people who are sort of tangent, tangential to us on our advisory technical team. We have Dr. Rail Lipson, who is, along with Quinton Hennig, one of the preeminent Paleoplacer experts in the world. Dr. Martin Williams, who is you know, one of the three best geochemists in the world, environmental geochemists in the world. So, so we have this great team to work with. And, and our approach is always get someone really, really, really good in at the beginning of the project, have our project level people then advance that work and have some, get that person who is really, really good in at the end of the project again to summarize it up and make sure it was all done correctly. That way you get efficient work, our own staff learn, but you're not paying for a world level expert the whole time. You, you bring them in, you, you get their information, and then you run with it. That's the sort of philosophy we use. Now, this may be a first for me for calling someone out, and you did reference that you were very conservative. But from the board of directors to management and technical team, you guys have a proven pedigree of taking project from exploration to development and into production. And I want to underscore that for our audience members here. No, absolutely. Um, I was 
you know, watching, look, reading through a, a Hothschild's analyst report recently and the pine catamine, the immaculata mine that we found and discovered and, and what led to Hothschild's buying international minerals, which is probably the critical aspect from a shareholder point of view. Those mines were, were sensationally, sensational mines. You know, we discovered them, we developed them, and then we got to a liquidity point for our shareholders because of them, which I think is the, the main aspect here. And, but yeah, we, we've done it multiple times and you know, this is this is the next one in in a series of mines, and, and this one looks as good as anything else we've ever worked on because of its you know, the grade, the simplicity of the project, simplicity of the metallurgy. This is going to be a mine. Let's get into some numbers. Please share the capital structure of TriStar Gold. Okay, TriStar has 178 million shares outstanding right now, and if we were go fully diluted, you're 216 million. How much cash and cash equivalents do you have? We have about Canadian $6 million in the bank right now. And we have you know, received or we will receive from the Royal Gold transaction another 4 million Canadian over the next seven months. Um, you know, as long as we keep advancing this project and, and keep the drilling going forward on this project, so which, which we will do. So, so that's it. So we've got 6 million Canadian now and another 4 million due in by March of next year. How much debt do you have? Zero. What is your burn rate? Our burn rate for purely holding the company together and doing nothing is around 150,000 US a month. When we get drilling now, we will be spending up to about $700,000 a month. Who are the major shareholders? Our largest shareholder is US Global out of um, San Antonio, Texas. I think the second largest shareholder is Gold 2000 out of Zurich. Um, and then we have RBC, Global Asset Management out of Toronto and Sun Valley, um, probably hold 2 or 3% as well. And then there's a few individuals who hold 5, 6, 7% as well. And how much, how much of a position does management have? We consider the insiders, management and friends and family associates have 27%. I believe management directly holds between 12 and 15%. And what is the float? In retail float, the best we can estimate is around 38% of the shares outstanding. Are there any redundant assets on the books that we should know about? No, no, no. We, we've been focusing solely on Casella de Sonius. Are there any change of control fees? And if yes, what is the compensation? Yeah, our executive management, such as myself and Scott, the CFO, and the Vice President, we have standard change of control clauses in place. I don't have the exact numbers of what they mean. Uh, it would be, I believe, two years would be the payout. Um, again, that is there, so we make sure they're motivated to get to a liquidity point for the shareholders rather than becoming reliant on, on, a, on a salary. Is management charging a consultant fee for any services? No. In closing, Multi-layered question. What is the next unanswered question for TriStar Gold? When can we expect a response and what determines success? The next unanswered question is, does the inferred resource upgrade as we expect to indicate it? We start drilling that in September, so we, we should have our initial answers by December, January. We don't, we are not, it's not something we're concerned about, but that is the next unanswered question. As we said, we would expect to have an answer on that by January as we start infield drilling in September now. What keeps you up at night that we don't know about? Over the last year or two, it's been financing. Yes, I know the project has delivered everything we asked of it. Yes, over, we've gone from 280,000 ounces resources to 2 million ounces resources in a very predictable fashion. Um, but what has been hard is getting has been raising money in this market, which is not a unique situation for TriStar. That's something that fit all the juniors. So I think it is still, you know, we have the financing now. I know the project will deliver. So doing the feasibility study doesn't keep me awake at work night. What does is how we get the market, will, how the market will react, and getting the getting the liquidity up in the shares. So that's what we're focusing on. That's the a new area we're working on now. Job Yard, what did I forget to ask? 
The only other thing I think that is relevant is the, the overall business plan for TriStar. We, we touched on whether we would build Castello de Sonos or someone else would or how we would do that. And I said it was a business decision. Our market plan had always been multiple projects, multiple jurisdictions. So we are always on the lookout for a, another major project in another political jurisdiction just to get political diversification. So that's something that we are open to and looking at all the time, um, but not aggressively. I mean, it's not at all cost. We will do something. It's if we see an opportunity, we will take it. Um, and, and again, we would be looking within the Americas, probably focusing the, you know, the initial focus on the Spanish speaking part of the Americas. Obviously, our whole Brazilian team speak Portuguese, but the rest of us all speak, most of us speak fluent Spanish. So anywhere Spanish or Portuguese speaking South America would be a great location for us to target a second project that we could then be advancing you know, in parallel with this. And doing that, that business plan of having multiple projects also allows us, we have this sensationally good high level team. I don't want to keep them busy and I don't want to burden Castello and Sonia with their salaries, but if you can have two or three projects, you can keep those people more focused, more at work and more dedicated to TriStar by giving them more hours spread, spread across more projects. So, so that's always been our big picture view. Mr. Appleyard, for someone listening that wants to get more information about TriStar Gold, please share the website address. Yeah, our website's very simple. It is tristargold.com. And I would recommend that the first thing someone does, there's a little corporate video. It's only 90 seconds, two minutes long. And I think it gives a really nice overview of the project and, and what it is and where it's going. So I think that, that would be the starting point I would recommend. For direct inquiries, call 480-794-1244. That number again is 480-794-1244. Or you may email info at tristargold.com. Tristar Gold trades on the TSXV, symbol TSG. Before you make your next bullion purchase, make sure you call me. I'm a licensed representative from Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments, where we provide a number of options to expand your precious metals portfolio from physical delivery, offshore depositories, precious metal IRAs, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Call me directly at 855-505-1900. That number again is 855-505-1900. Or you may email Maurice at milesfranklin.com. Finally, please subscribe to provenandprobable.com for mining insights and bullion sales. Nick Appleyard of TriStar Gold. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thank you. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.